PC is by far the most innovative and versatile video game platform to ever exist. And now, in 2019, PC gaming has grown into one of the largest and most popular markets in the entire video game industry. But have you ever wondered how it all started? If you did, then you clicked on the right video because today we're going to talk about the origins of PC gaming, dating back almost 70 years. In a previous video, I told the story of Birdie the Brain, the world's first video game invented in 1950. And a lot of people were surprised to discover that the history of video games extends so far beyond the release of POM. So today we're going to dig deeper into that early period of video game history. And of course, this period in time predates consoles and handhelds, so all the games we will talk about today are computer games. As was the case with Birdie the Brain, most of these computer games were built to provide a tech demo to showcase the power of new computing technology. So just keep in mind that these games were never commercially sold to the public, which is probably why you've never heard of them, or even knew that video games existed during this time. As we discussed in the last video, the first video game was Birdie the Brain, a tic-tac-toe playing machine showcased at the 1950 Canadian National Exhibition. Almost one year later, the world's second video game would be introduced to the public, and it actually has a very similar story to the first video game. Developed by British engineering firm Ferranti, Nimrod was an advanced computer capable of playing Nim, a strategy game in which two players take turns removing objects from a pile. The goal of the game, essentially, is to take the last object in the pile, and you lose when it's your turn and there are no more objects in the pile. So, here's how Nimrod worked. The player sits on a desk with a control panel containing a grid of buttons laid out exactly the same as the lights displayed on the computer. Now, the lights represent objects, and the buttons on the control panel represent moves by the player. Now, I actually have a simulation of the game that I can show you so you have a better idea of how the game worked. Yeah, so someone programmed a pretty good replication of Nimrod and pretty much gives you a good idea of how the game works. So this is the, the overall, this is the display of the game. So assume that you're sitting on the, uh, on the desk with the control panel of all the buttons laid out. Uh, the buttons are represented by this and the lights were the ones that was just displayed on the actual Nimrod machine. So let's just see how this um, works. So to set up the game, you have to uh, tell the computer how many objects you want laid out in the game, and then you hit play. So it's my move. So the buttons that I press, so assuming I'm sitting on the desk playing the Nimrod, and the buttons that are over there uh, represent the moves that I make. So if I want to, let's say, remove half of the objects of this pile, then I do this. So now it's the computer's turn, and you know obviously you're not going to be clicking around in the original game. This is just a simulation, but essentially, uh, after I make that move on the Nimrod machine, uh, the computer would instantly react and make their own move. As you can see, the Nimrod is replicating the moves that I just made, and that's why it's so difficult to beat, because the whole premise of the Nim game is to be the last person to collect all the objects, but if the Nim machine is replicating all the moves that you're making, uh, then that becomes incredibly challenging because uh, you're going first and then he comes after you and then it's just like there's it's very difficult and you'll see because I'll, I'll play a complete game just so you have an idea of how challenging this game really was. So let's just remove one object and let's see what he does. He does the same exact thing. Okay, well maybe I want to remove, no uh, oh, I just removed another object. Let's say I want to remove everything. And he just does the same exact thing. And let's say I want to remove one object. Computer removes one object. You, you guys can see where this game is going, and it doesn't look good for me. So, I mean, I'll, I'll continue playing, but you have you get the gist. See? And then the computer won. So it's it's an incredibly challenging game. I mean, it's already a challenging game. Uh, to begin with, but having a, a pretty smart computer. And remember, this computer existed in 1951. So to have a really smart AI system that can that, that's incredibly difficult to beat, 
is pretty damn impressive. And that's that's what we saw with uh, with Birdie the Brain. But it's nice that we have this little simulation because you, you at least have an idea of, of how challenging this game truly was. In the early 1950s, computers were a new emerging technology with amazing potential. And what better way to showcase the potential of Ferranti computing technology than to set the, 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 the their entire demonstration on a game that is fundamentally based on principles of addition and subtraction. What better way to showcase the capabilities of Ferranti technology than to replicate the game of NIM? So the Nimrod computer was displayed at the 1951 Festival of Britain. Included with the price of admission, attendees of the festival were free to play Nimrod and try to beat the AI, but most people never could, myself included. <laughs> and for the price of one shilling and six pence, attendees of the festival had the option of buying a guidebook explaining the game's rules and offer tips in defeating the AI, which makes the Nimrod guidebook the world's first video game strategy guide. Nimrod became the most popular exhibit at the Festival of Britain, though the attendees at the festival were far more interested in the game itself than the technology behind it, the exhibit was considered a great success. It was so successful that Ferranti set up another exhibit months later at the Berlin Industrial Show. And just like Birdie of the Brain, as soon as it served its purpose, the machine was unfortunately dismantled. Uh, though a replica exhibit is currently displayed at the Computerspiel Museum in Berlin, the original machine no longer exists, unfortunately. Uh, the early 1950s also saw the development of several chess and checkers programs, though most of these programs were unplayable. But as we approach the mid-1950s, we begin to see the evolution of computer games from demonstrative exhibits in which the game and the computer were essentially one and the same, into individual programs that are compatible with specific hardware. The first game to start that trend was Knots and Crosses, which happens to be another tic-tac-toe game. But instead of being a dedicated machine like Birdie the Brain, Knots and Crosses was a program compatible with the Electronic Delay Storage Automatic Calculator, or the EDSAC, one of the world's first computers. So this was an individual program that was compatible with the hardware rather than the game being the actual hardware itself. Developed by graduate student Alexander Douglas for his thesis on artificial intelligence, Knots and Crosses was the first video game with a full visual display rather than the light bulbs and the, the light display that you see in Birdie the Brain and the Nimrod games. And you could see it start to resemble the computer games of the 1980s. And for 1952, I'd say the graphics are pretty damn impressive. And instead of a keyboard and mouse, players used a rotary telephone for controls. And I actually have another simulation to show you guys so you guys can have an idea of how this game played out. So here we actually got a simulation program of OXO running on a, an emulator for Mac. And you could see the, the rotary dial on the bottom it simulates the rotary phone dial. And this is how it works. So you press, you, you dial the number on the rotary phone. And then based on that, that's the position that you are placed on the, the tic-tac-toe board. So, and the, the order that it goes on is from right to left. So the first number one would be on the bottom and you could see the corresponding moves um number two would be in the bottom middle number three would be on the bottom left and then it keeps going and going and going so i'm not going to delve too much into this because it's very similar to to uh birdie the brain which we talked about before it's pretty much a game of tic-tac-toe right it, it doesn't get much more simple than that uh, as far as explaining how the game works except in, this is a, a rotary phone dial of a control which I thought was very interesting and obviously all the stuff that you see on the screen except for the actual uh, green light uh, is just uh, trying to simulate how the actual computer works so the EDSAC computer uh, and I, yeah like I would say the, the graphics are pretty good um, for 1952 it reminds me a lot of those terminal games in Fallout 4 the next big gameplay innovation that we see in the 1950s occurs two years later in 1954 when William Brown and Ted Lewis programmed a pool game for the University of Michigan supercomputer, the MidSac. Uh, all the previous games we discussed so far were all turn-based, including the tic-tac-toe games and the NIM game, where 
you make your turn, then the opponent makes the turn, and then it goes back and forth and back and forth. But obviously, pool is a game that runs in real time, as you need to aim your pool cue, then hit the balls, and then watch them move around across the pool table and keep track of which balls, you know, which which ones were solid, which ones are striped. So pool is more of a real time game as opposed to uh, tic tac toe and nim, which are more turn based. This makes the 1954 pool game the first video game to operate in real time. To aim the pool cue, there was a small knob attached to the screen. Though no gameplay footage actually exists, unfortunately, you do get a pretty good idea of how the game played from the photograph as well as the time period in which it was developed. Now, the final game of the decade was 1958's Tennis for Two. Now, this game didn't innovate too much compared to pool, except that it was designed for two players, rather than facing off against an AI. Uh, unlike all the other games that we've talked about today, this is the first video game designed purely for entertainment purposes, as there was no technological purpose for this game. The designer, William Higginbottom, just wanted to create a cool exhibit for visitors of the Brookhaven National Laboratory to enjoy, and they sure as hell enjoyed it. The exhibit was so popular that it would be featured again the following year. Just look at this game and tell me it doesn't remind you a lot of the Magnavox Odyssey and Atari's Pong. And from the dial controls to the analog graphics, all the way to the tennis game itself, you can clearly tell that Magnavox and Atari were inspired by this game in designing their table tennis game. And it seems that I'm not alone in thinking that. Got some fun trivia, actually. In the late 1970s, when Magnavox was suing Atari and other video game developers for infringing on their intellectual property, Atari and other video game manufacturers sued by Magnavox cited Tennis for Two as proof that Magnavox did not own the rights to Pong and all the other table tennis variations that sprung up throughout the first generation of consoles. Now, the 1970s is certainly another interesting period in video game history that deserves a lot more attention, and we'll get there eventually. The next episode, we're going to take a look at computer games of the 1960s and continue to witness the evolution of PC gaming and video games as a whole. Now, with that being said, thank you all so very much for tuning into this episode of my documentary series, and I hope to see you again soon. Until next time, bye.